Good evening. I'm Bertrand Buchwalter. I'm the director of the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni, and I am delighted to welcome you online for another event tonight. I mean, I'm all the more delighted because tonight we are launching a new program, Art Matters, a series of conversations about art. In the challenging times that we are living in, we feel it is important to listen to art and to what art can teach us about the world. Art is the seismograph of society. It can help us to better understand the world. And we felt at the Institut Francais that it was also up to us to contribute to this better understanding of the world. Hence, art matters. We will continue in the months to come to invite prominent French uh, artists such as Zineb Sedira or Jean-Luc uh, Moulin. And in doing so, we will also be very eager to put forward a great project of ours that we have launched 10 years ago, Fluxus Art Project, which is a unique project which brings together French and British artists and curators, and which has been a resounding success. Tonight, we'll have two artists and two curators that were all supported by Fluxus Art Project, We'll have Isabelle Cornaro, who is an artist and art historian, preselected for the Marcel Duchamp Prize. We'll have Mathieu Cleyebe Abonenc, artist, researcher, exhibition curator, and film programmer. We'll have Dr. Tiffany Boyle, independent curator and writer, part of the curatorial duo Mother Tongue, and researcher based at the Glasgow School of Art. And to lead this conversation, We'll have Valentin Umansky, curator at the Tate Modern in London and artistic director of the Taurus Foundation for Arts and Sciences in Lausanne and in Nigeria. Tonight, they will explore, in the context of colonial and post-colonial history, the methods and principles behind artistic and curatorial practices involved with the recording, recording and interpretation of the real. Thank you very much to all of you for accepting our invitation. And before I give the floor to uh, Catherine uh, Petitga, Catherine, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. I'd like to thank my team, who has done an amazing work uh, to put together this, uh, this program. And I would like also to have a word for uh, Fluxus Art Projects. Uh, a word also for you, Catherine, because you've been a, 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 a wonderful uh, su supporter of this uh, project. You are the chairperson of Fluxus Art Projects. And without you, without the support of all the patrons, private patrons of Fluxus Art Projects, without the support of the French Ministry of Culture, without the support of the British Council, uh, Fluxus, uh, Fluxus Art Projects would not have been uh, possible. And for us, it is a very critical uh, project in the times that we are living in and we are very happy to have uh, this opportunity to highlight the, the, all the, the achievements of Fluxus R projects. Without further ado, Catherine, I give you uh, the floor. Thank you, thank you uh, again and I know that for you, like for us, art matters. At Art Matters very much indeed, Bertrand. Thank you very much. I'm Catherine Petitga. I'm the founding godmother and chair of Fluxus Art Projects. And I'm particularly delighted today that uh, this uh, inaugural session of Art Matters is dedicated to well-loved alumni of Fluxus, uh, as Bertrand uh, pointed out, uh, Isabelle Cornaro, uh, nominee for this year's Marcel Duchamp Prize, Uh, who um, we supported in 2015 for her first exhibition in Britain. Uh, it was a double exhibition at uh, the Spike Island Projects in Bristol and at the Southampton Gallery uh, in Peckham in London. We are very happy that she is back with us today. And we also have supported in the past uh, Mathieu Cleyebe Abonac. We uh, supported him for his residency and exhibition at Gasworks in Vauxhall, also in London. Uh, and today, of course, we are very happy that 
that is here for another project supported by uh, Fluxus, uh, the mother tongue, who is also participating in the conversation. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you back with us uh, today. Now, I just wanted to say a few words about um, Fluxus art projects for those of you who may not be as familiar uh, with our structure. Um, uh, Fluxus art projects is a Franco-British initiative uh, to support emerging French artists in Britain and British artists in France. What we support are exhibitions in public um, institutions, uh, from large museums to small um, experimental spaces. Uh, our goal is really to strengthen the uh, career of an artist at a critical time to help them professionalize. But our goal is also to build up on the extraordinary relationship between our two countries uh, at a time when, unfortunately, it's being put to the test. So I think this is also a very important mission of, uh, of Fluxus. Now, we uh, operate with a, a call for projects. Uh, we have two open calls every year, in May and in November. Uh, the uh, projects are judged by an artistic committee that includes uh, artists, uh, art professionals of our two countries, uh, of France and Britain, as well as a representative of our members and of our public partners. Uh, as uh, Bertrand mentioned earlier, um, the Institut Francais, the French Ministry of Culture, the the British Council and Creative Scotland uh, very soon. We are very grateful for all your support. Now, um, our next open call is going to take place in April, mid-April. Please check our brand new um, website, Fluxus uh, Art Projects, uh, for more detail and more news on this, as well as the uh, website of the Institut Francais. Um, we are very uh, grateful for your interest. Thank you very much for listening to us today. And now I'm very pleased to hand over to uh, Valentin Umansky, who is going to be chairing this conversation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So my name is uh, Valentine Umansky. I'm one of the curators at Tate Modern, and it is a great uh, pleasure to welcome you all tonight for a conversation um, called Records and Discords in the Real, which will bring together um, one curator and two artists. Has been, they, they've all been um, partly uh, introduced. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, um, backroom uh, suggestions. Um, we, I will uh, lead this conversation, which will uh, give us about 30, 35 minutes um, to speak directly with uh, Mathieu Kleibé, Abonenk, Isabel Cornaro, and Tiffany Boy. Um, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for a Q&A. So um, stay tuned and uh, feel free to share uh, questions as they come along. Uh, we'll, we'll touch back on all of those um, towards the end. Um, so. I just wanted to start, uh, although they've been partly uh, introduced, um, to say that um, this conversation hopefully will highlight a, a part, part of what uh, our speakers will have been working on. Um, they will discuss their joint and respective research. Um, and I, I'll introduce um, the three of them and their biographies in a couple of words um, without going too, too far into it, um, starting uh, with Mathieu. Um, so Mathieu, uh, I guess I, I should start by saying that um, Mathieu was born in French Guiana and raised in Cayenne. I, I tend to actually not speak about biographical details, but I think this one specifically informs a lot of his work. Um, and he moved to France um, uh, when he was about 15 years old. And all of his work since has been uh, focused on cultural he hegemonies upon which um, kind of the evolution of contemporary societies is based. Um, so the slide that you can see here just uh, highlights some of the key themes that will be discussed uh, during this conversation around absence, violence, and mechanisms of abstraction and uh, extraction and excavation. Um, and maybe the conversation will give us a bit of an opportunity to talk about um, some of the publications he's been working with as well with B42. But the one for which he was um, awarded uh, the Fluxus Art Projects with uh, uh, Tiffany Boyle um, is called Delineate. So maybe I'm, I'm jumping here um, to introduce Tiffany. Um, so Tiffany 
is a curator who initiated um, a platform, um, a duo called Mother Tongue, uh, with Jessica Carden in 2009. Um, and uh, throughout her career, she's been working on a variety of notions and projects um, that brought together exhibitions, publications, uh, and other kinds of commissions, and often um, delve on questions of diasporic um, experiences, specifically um, Afro-Scottish identities. Um, in 2014, she curated uh, an exhibition which I hope we can discuss, A Thousand of Them Scattered. Um, in 2016, she co-curated Rum Retort, uh, which established connections between Greenock, Scotland and the Caribbean. Um, and most recently, she's been awarded uh, um, the Fluxus grant uh, for a project um, that will take the form of an artist book, Delineate, um, which she is uh, collaborating on with Caius Banco and many studios, and commissioned uh, Mathieu uh, to write a text for. Um, this specific project we'll, we'll talk more in, in details about, but it links um, paper milling, cotton and linen, um, and the production of cotton and linen. Um, so bringing together the idea of colonial trade uh, between Scotland and the New World. And um, to end, I just uh, want to say a couple words about uh, Isabelle Cornaro. Um, and um, to say that maybe Isabelle's work um, has spanned a variety of uh, media, painting, sculpture, film, and installation, um, but always explores kind of the influence and the culture of, um, on, on our perception of reality. Um, she studied uh, art history, actually, at the Ecole du Louvre and the Beaux-Arts in Paris, in Paris um, and specialized on since, since 16th uh, century mannerism. And I, I say that that point because I think a lot of the references that she draws upon in her work um, go back to uh, part of that art history, uh, but question it and replay it. Um, and as was mentioned in 2015, she was awarded uh, the Fluxus Grant for a two-part solo exhibition uh, in Bristol and at the South London Gallery, uh, which I hope we can we can speak a bit more about. So I, I will start maybe by asking a, a very broad question to all of our speakers tonight, um, which is about the theme of this conference, um, records and discards in the real. Maybe this is an enigmatic, enigmatic saying. Um, so I will ask all of you what the, this theme meant for you as uh, I'm responsible for it. Um, and maybe what, we, what I want to highlight is um, this question of recording, um, what, what kind of recording of reality does your, your work discuss? Um, maybe with that, I want to chat a bit about questions of accuracy. Is art a proper way to kind of um, talk about reality? And in what ways um, are there tensions in, in the way we talk about reality as artists, but also as curators? Um, and so maybe I can uh, hand over to uh, Mathieu since I started with you. Um, and whoever wants to to respond uh, is welcome because I think this is a broad first question. <clears throat> um, thanks a lot for the introduction, and I'm really really thrilled to be to be here. Um, I guess you know it comes with a um, methodology, a way of working, and uh, a way of. Uh, um, um or the a way to to try to find you know this tiny tiny way of entering big uh, big uh, big moments of collective history or at the way i function with with the real let's say so to me there's there's always some kind of way to connect with this kind of uh, big events or big historical moments and uh, and to try to to locate you know the where where there is uh, some kind of um, uh, erasure, some kind of uh, some because you are, you are showing this this drawing for example and uh, which which is a really old work that I started like more than fifteen years ago and that were called slave trade landscapes. 
and uh, which are more or less uh, my way to to discuss with what I felt was the um, the, um, uh, the 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 way the the French state or the French the French history was dealing with its colonial history at the time. And so I did this this kind of drawing that were copies of engraving uh, produced at, by the end of the 19th century, and um, and I forgot, you know, to copy, for example, the the colonizer and the the colonized. So to me, it was a double gesture uh, because at some point it was a way to to let's say open open possibilities. Uh, so instead of this kind of colonizers and colonized uh, representation, you you have these kind of blank spaces. But at the same time, it was a way to underline, you know, this kind of erasure that is still at the moment. Uh, th that's that's still what's happening now in our and um, our collective history in France. So. Um, and you are showing this picture, and then you know this blank space became a kind of cinema screen so a real projection projection space and i guess uh i don't know but <laughs> that's i know that in in isabel's work there's a lot of screen as well <laughs> and, uh, so yeah nice way to hand the mic to me isabel i think Yeah, I was um, following what uh, Mathieu was talking about. I think it's indeed a question, the recording um, and discarding is indeed a question of, let's say, point of view, which is uh, an issue, a uh, question on which we all uh, work. Um, to me, it's also a question of the fantasmatic relation we, we have with reality and how it's made of symbolism and fantasies as well as much as history, social history and personal history. And um, um, as, uh, as for my work, as a, let's say in terms of processes, I know that indeed the recording process is important, whether I use films uh, or castings, for instance, which is uh, um, something that are uh, or indeed found object as we see in these installations and so all these um, objects or images that are um, found object or uh, images from art history they um, do indeed record as part of uh, the real and for me what i'm interested in is the sort of search around this object which uh, would play, let's say, as somehow a sort of search of truth, with a, whatever it is, and in that aspect, we could say that it has a certain moralism in it, a sort of moralistic aspect in this research between truth and false. I think that's also an interesting point to to bring in uh, for Tiffany, I guess, uh, especially around ethical questions in your cur curator practice. Would you mind sharing a bit? Sure. Well, I mean, I think for me, in terms of the, the theme for this evening, um, I think uh, similarly to Mathieu, I was thinking of it a lot in terms of um, working methodologies. I, I work a lot with um, archives and collections um, in my projects, not only our artistic archives or collections, but, um, uh, you know, also thinking about things that exist out there in the real world. Um, buildings or um, I included in one of my slides a past project from 2018 um, was, was a presentation of um, a Montreal-based artist Nadia Mir for Glasgow International and um, the, these sculptures are made from fragments of clay tobacco pipes which were um, collected on the uh, River Thames um, in London when the tide was out there um, you know they're kind of like 200 year old cigarette butts so you know, I mean, it's kind of like a public archive. <laughs> um, so I guess when I say archives, I, I really mean everything. Um, but I mean, I think that in terms of the way that I have been trying to use archives in my practice has been to kind of disentangle or to complicate narratives, especially kind of mainstream or very well established narratives. But I'm also, I guess, uh, to ask questions about how you bring that information back into the space. So 
perhaps rather than trying to create a contending narrative and um, thinking about ways in which you can use this information just to kind of fracture um, you know, the story that people have uh, uh, been believing or following. I mean, I think that um, something that has uh, been really shaping uh, my practice um, in the context of Scotland has been that since 2014, um, I think there's been a real momentum in Scotland for re-evaluating our role in empire. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, in some respects, it's, it's um, kind of laughable that Scotland was thinking before then that it didn't have such a very strong role. It was, um, you know, kind of planted very much south of the border. Um, but I think that this momentum to to reevaluate with, you know, with some honesty and integrity, I think, has, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a very important kind of context for some of the, the work I've been doing in some of the shows. Thank you for, for sharing all three of you. Um, it also brought to my mind the question of um, kind of a certain way of telling history and a univocal way of telling history, which you all contradict uh, in, in various uh, forms. Uh, Mathieu, I was thinking a, a lot about one of your films that um, that I hold personally very dear, that I hope we can talk about, which is uh, Forward uh, to Guns for Banta, um, which I'm interested in in this context because, in a way, um, it, it's a film that refers to the work of a filmmaker, Sarah Maldoror. Um, mm -hmm. I was really interested how, in the end, actually because of the lack of archives and the inaccessibility of the actual film that Sarah shot, uh, which has disappeared, um, you worked with the actual archives and scripts and you find, found three endings. So in a way, it kind of made manifest in the work the impossibility to actually tell a univocal story. So, so there was that that I was thinking about as you were uh, all talking. Um, and I think also to what um, Isabel was uh, mentioning, there is something that I'm really interested uh, in your work, uh, that is the maybe the translation, the act of translation. Um, the question of translating um, nature, landscape, and often a classical pastoral landscape, um, you've, you've referred to uh, Nicolas Poussin quite a lot, and translating that into a spatial arrangement of, of plants with objects. Um, so with the question of translating, we bring in uh, questions of uh, facsimile, resemblance, and therefore also the, the, the divide between reality and uh, the interpretation. So I, I, I wanted to, to ask uh, Isabel if, if you could expand a bit maybe around this idea of translation um, and interpretation. Uh, yes, through translation, I was interested in um, um, somehow what is very specific to the common forms. Uh, so s somehow how an idea um, can be the same and take different forms or how form can seem different and still um, talk about the same idea. And uh, so it's uh, somehow it's a question about the significant and the signifier and the possible dissociation of it. And also, um, um, uh, uh, facsimile and, re and notions of resemblance are also completely embedded in art history. And for instance, one of the first uh, castings I did was uh, arrangements of accumulation of objects. I'm sorry, I didn't give you the image. Um, <laughs> that uh, show objects that are in naturalist shapes accumulated and then objects that are uh, covered with stylized patterns and then objects that, are, that have geometrical forms so that they were, let's say, following systems of resemblance that were abstraction, stylization and naturalism. But at the same time, they were real objects casted, but they were also objects as themselves. So I was interested in the fact that they are both what they are and at the same time signifiers for cate aesthetical categories. I'm not sure I answered your question properly. You did, you did. <laughs> okay. And I brought this slide up, uh, Savane autour de Bangui, et le fleuve de Bangui. Um, yeah, 
I can maybe just say one word to finish and before leaving the word to someone else. Indeed, this landscape, our landscape of um, uh, um, the part of Africa I grew up in, which is Central Africa, and they are made of uh, personal um, jewels, of um, jewelries I got in my family, and they actually represent um, these African landscapes uh, nearby Bangui. So that it's called Savannah surrounding Bangui and the river Utubangi. And for me, what I was interested in is that they are both somehow symbol, very naive symbolic landscapes, but at the same time, very real and irreducible somehow objects to themselves. So they, are, they have, they have, they are, they have um, two different kinds of meanings, both as themselves and part of my history, let's say, and also as uh, graphical signs. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's also, I think, uh, true in some ways uh, of certain objects in, in, um, in Matthew's practice. Um, and actually, the savanna specifically made me think of a, a project I, I don't have a slide of, Matthew, but I was curious about, which is the ring. Uh, I believe is a ring from your great grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a similarity. Obviously, it's jewelry, but also it's a symbol. Um, the ring uh, is a symbol of Kunani. So in, in Guyana, um, I, in I, actually, the the uh, the ring is is uh, belong to my great grandfather, and uh, it was this kind of uh, initiation ring, and uh, to a secret society. And so that's that's the thing I think that perhaps we share with Isabel. It's what how you deal with legacy at some point. So you can you can deal with legacy with a very um, or actually I I would say oh I deal with legacy. It's you don't know what you are dealing with actually. Or to me you you don't know what you are. You in the case of the ring you don't know what what. I didn't know what was this thing, so I decided to to uh, smelt the this ring and to produce like a kind of uh, memento mori, which is uh, to produce the same ring but with the, the 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 figure inside the ring in negative. So suddenly you are the the ring becomes a ghost of of itself, and so you are you and it's becoming even more esoteric that it was at in first instance, which is pretty much the way I'm working now, which is all my, the, the, the object uh, uh, I'm producing, they, uh, they need to have this kind of uh, uh, look, which is close to the initiation process. And so, uh, because there is a secret, and the secret is in all the work, and that's pretty much the way I'm trying to, to work with things, and that's the reason why I'm so interested, for example, in the work of Wilson Harris, because Wilson Harris works, which is this Guyanese uh, writer, works with secrets, and secrecy, and hermetism, and uh, so, yeah. Well, thank you to both of you, actually. And uh, just maybe something you mentioned around the memento mori or um, and some aspects of the kinds of objects um, is also something we discussed a bit, uh, Isabel, when we chatted uh, over the phone. Uh, and you said something, I hope I, I, I don't know if I took a good note of it, um, but uh, you said something about uh, the objects m reminding us uh, of our, our fate. Yes. And I, I highlighted something common in your practice, both your practices, which is in a way the funerary aspect of the object. This happens. Yes, <laughs> this for sure. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, the funerary aspect of the object um, and the kinds of objects that uh, you choose kind of talk about a certain morning. Um, there are some of them, they, they look like ossuaries. And, mm -hmm. and Matthew, um, in a lot of the, the works that we discussed together, and specifically uh, uh, in your recent exhibition, maybe the, we can talk about the flute made of bone. 
Um, so I just wanted to highlight the kinds of uh, aspects of the object that you're highlighting in your works and speak about this funerary aspect. It's just the question is for me. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, we we were uh, talking about that that um, um, uh, around uh, this animation I did that is uh, titled Celebration and that was uh, using imagery from uh, Walt Disney where you see uh, object animated with feelings and what I was always interested by using found object uh, and daily object or memorial objects is uh, how we anthropomorphize them and identify to them and uh, I had the feeling that this um, kind of relation very effective when we entertain with objects is not only because they, sh they carry memory but um, or is whether it's historical or personal but also because there is we have a sort of in France we would say connivence I don't know how you say it in English um, it's an intimate relation to this objective and very physical aspect of our self, which is uh, the becoming um, of as a corpse, basically. And so this uh, we have we know this tension between uh, animate and inanimate. And I think that I had this idea that um, this is also not only uh, because of the history of the object themselves, why we have this kind of yeah intimate uh, feeling towards them. And maybe uh, um, that connects also to to indeed Wilson Harris and, and some of the objects um, that were in the exhibition at uh, Marcel Alix, Mathieu. Um, especially, I, I, I'm thinking a lot about this flute, but uh, I think also in a way the turtle um, and the relationship of gallium between uh, liquid and solid is also talking about this uh, transitional moment of uh, absolutely. The yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the exhibition at Marcel Alix was uh, like the way to connect with different. Uh, so this was at Marcel Alix. It's an, an yeah, but uh, it's uh, for example we have these objects. Uh, that uh, are, you know, the, the objects I found uh, on the upper Maroni River in uh, French Guiana. And uh, these objects were at the uh, belonged, or actually, what, what can, we, can, can we say belong to, to, uh, to the house that my mother possessed in the, on the upper Maroni River? And you have just in, all the objects that are necessary to survive, uh, survive in the forest, and to me that what was important is to really it was a way to show the bare life, let's say. So really the the the, the it's a it's a survival uh, kit, let's say, and, and at the same time it's uh, it's what so you have uh, what like. Uh, enough to 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 survive there and, um, and uh, when it comes to the bone flutes to the uh, organs to the turtle shell all these are really poetical figures that are kind of worked with and that uh, that were produced by reading uh, Aris's text and uh, so the bone flute for example is really Important is Aris Aris uh, literature because it's it's really uh, the entry point of his idea of syncretism as well. So because that's why I'm so interested in in uh, his text. It's because it, he has produced something which is not uh, not the creation of Edouard Glissant, for example. And not neither the Brazilian modernism of Oswald de Andrade. So he has produced something which is kind of singular and proper to the Guiana shield. And that's the reason why I'm, yeah, um, that's the discussion we have with, with, with Tiffany, actually. <laughs> and I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> Do you want to jump in? Ah. Uh. 
Well, I mean, um, I, what, what Matthew is, is kind of referring to is that in some of the Afroscots research I have been doing, um, I was looking, there was an attempt to set up an Edinburgh branch of the Caribbean artist movement um, between uh, Trinidadian literature scholar Kenneth Ramchand and um, the Barbadian poet Kamal Braithwaite. Um, and this is taking place in quite an international time where there's quite a lot of Afro-Caribbean arts activity in Scotland, um, kind of in the 60s. But uh, anyway, uh, the Caribbean, this Edinburgh branch of the Caribbean artist movement, it doesn't um, really get any momentum, but they, they try to kick it off with a lecture from Wilson Harris, um, uh, which there's a, there's a transcript of it held, held in London. So we had been speaking a little bit before about this, uh, this little overlap between Wilson Harris and, and Scotland. Um, but I, I also found it really interesting to, um, I guess, hear Matthew and Isabel speak about the way in which they're kind of mining the personal in their work. Um, because I think that um, in preparation for the Delineate project as an artist book, one of the things um, which I was doing as a kind of curatorial research was um, the region in Scotland where I'm from is very small and it's not very exciting, I have to say, <laughs> um, but it's traditionally known for paper milling and for coal mining. Um, and there is a, is a river that runs through the River Esk. Um, and there's, there's never been a, a, any kind of public art gallery or museum in the region. And I had been thinking a lot about everyone I know who's from there and who has left to pursue their artistic endeavors elsewhere. And I was I was thinking a lot about you know this paper as the surface that we're often working on in the arts and um, I started to do these different walks along the river to um, kind of retrace uh, these paper mills. Some of them there's some kind of vestige of the building of its kind of structure, and others are kind of really completely gone. Um, but I guess it was an interesting process for me because um, actually a lot of the places I was walking, even though I grew up there, I had never been there. Um, so I was kind of discovering this place that I grew up in all over again. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, th I think w within those paper mills, there were there's whole um, layers for how they relate to kind of colonial trade at the time, gender relations and um, kind of very early ecological and um, kind of governmental um, uh, the paper mills were polluting the river very heavily <laughs> and so there's kind of some very early initiatives from the kind of local government to try and tidy the river up um, but yeah I mean there's uh, they, they, they seem kind of these very very small um, things you know a paper mill pa paper mill seems like quite a simple industry but when you understand the way in which it's connected to bank notes and cotton linen and um, uh, you begin to see that it's actually part of a much more complicated um, uh, picture uh, so yeah I for me there was also an aspect of mining my own kind of personal backgrounds and um, in the lead up to this project and um, before um, this collaboration with Natalia and KS before we joined forces <laughs> and if you don't mind uh, actually speaking to some of your other projects, because I do think there is something um, indeed uh, recurrent in the way you're considering um, the history of violent relationship to the landscapes, uh, whether it's tobacco, whether it's, uh, you know, I was also really interested in um, the, the relationship to uh, indigenous practices. It's not simply um, the trade, but some of the practices like the clay pipes. Um, yeah researching yeah i mean i think that the project with nadia um I, I through the british council i had been able to go to montreal in 2017 and we we had a studio visit and um she was showing us this uh, small kind of maquette that she had made uh, which was these kind of woven uh, bead like um pieces of clay and she had started to weave them into kind of like a, a tree structure and um, Nadia was explaining that she had been in London for, for a residency and she had been walking along the Thames when the tide was out. And she saw these and they reminded her of wampum, which um, in the First Nations they often use for weaving treaties. Um, and some of these historical treaties that were made with the colonizers at that kind of first point of contact, um, they are long broken on the side of the, the colonizers, but um, the First Nations still consider these a binding document. Um, so she was saying that she she saw these and she 
you know, um, pick them up and, and recognize them as wampum, as, as beads before she then began to understand that um, the, the clay tobacco back pipes after Europeans had started to go to the so-called New World, um, smoking tobacco was part of um, uh, the process of kind of meeting and greeting one another and signing treaties. Um, and then this tobacco came back and uh, Europe kind of, uh, let's say, stole this indigenous technology of these clay tobacco pipes. So you would get the pipe and it would be pre-stuffed with tobacco and you would smoke a little bit and then you would snap it off and just you know throw it away and you would just work your way down so i mean they were a, a really interesting object in the sense that they um they seemed very fragile but they have lasted very well in the river and um they're quite beautiful but they're also very kind of skeletal very bone like i was helping nadia to collect some from the river and sometimes i would pick up a piece of bone by mistake thinking it was a shard of clay tobacco pipe and then later on realize what it was um, uh, that we had. Um, but I mean, I think one of the things that we were really interested in um, in terms of working with Nadia, is, as I was saying, there has been this reevaluation of Scotland's um, relations through Empire to the Caribbean, but this was really like a nuance of, of that relation. So instead of thinking about uh, tobacco coming into Scotland, this was then, you know, further complicating that um, considering the relation to the First Nation peoples in Canada, whose kind of techno technology was appropriated to facilitate the smoking, the smoking of this tobacco. Um, but I mean, I think that in the display at the Brigitte, Nadia was also thinking a lot about the way in which um, museum display um, has traditionally approached um, Indigenous objects. And I think that um, she has, she's done some really interesting projects in the past, for example, with the McCord Museum in Montreal, where um, she has really um, played with that, <laughs> with some with some humor, um, <laughs> or very tongue in cheek, I guess I could say. Um, so, but as part of the opening for for that project at Glasgow International, uh, Nadia had woven a long, um, oh, it was about seventeen meters long, uh, a line uh, with the with the beads, and uh, there was a performance where the beads the beads were being hit against a a, a long plinth. And they kind of moved very beautifully. They were kind of like, you know, dominoes, the way that they would kind of unfurl themselves, this kind of motion from the hand. Um, uh, but in this process, they were also breaking down. So they were kind of fracturing and splintering and breaking um, onto the plinth. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, there, there was definitely something that was kind of violent about that kind of performative action at the opening. Um, but then at the same time, um, uh, yeah, it, it, there was it, it was very beautiful the way that they moved. <laughs> so, just before we move to questions, I just want to pick up on something you said around the the way these objects are displayed, usually, because I think there is also something that I. I really think is critical in Isabel's work, but also in a way um, uh, in some of Matthew's work is the physical representation of the act of, of watching <clears throat> the display. Um, and why, I, I was really curious um, why it is important for you, Isabel, for example, to make that stand manifest. Uh, what does it say about the role that you give to the viewer, the visitor in, in relation to reality? And then Matthew, similarly, <clears throat> uh, thinking to some of your films, uh, the anthropologist is present in the film. So we have uh, the metaphor as well of the act of, of looking at objects, of researching objects. So if you can speak to that and then uh, I'll move to questions. Should I, should I go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, it's true that, for instance, in the series the titled Paysage uh, uh, Landscapes, um, the perspective uh, system, for instance, is very important. It also relates to the 15th century and the beginning of big uh, travel around the world and somehow first imperialism. And uh, in the same way, I think the representation of the gaze is very important as a representation of a certain act, both of fascination and domination, uh, for me. 
And this perspective system, to come back to that, is, is also very, very uh, representative of a, a moment of domination. Yeah. Maybe Mathieu, I don't know if you want to speak also about the role of the, uh, the avatar that the anthropologist could be. Uh, I really don't know if it's an avatar for this. I, I used avatar, but uh, it's not an avatar in uh, sector 9b. But uh, it's true that uh, it's, uh, it's a discussion about uh, research itself and uh, a way to, because at one moment I'm uh, quoting uh, Louise White, the anthropologist, and uh, where she describes her methodology of, uh, of work. And uh, when she explained that she's trying to find a way to, to produce uh, a kind of affect uh, in the reader and in my, and for instance, for me, uh, for the viewer, uh, where you have all these elements that combines and that uh, produces something which is uh, physical. And uh, that's what I'm, what, what I'm trying to, to do. But at the same time, every time you have also the wall like uh, the machine that is completely open. And so you, you see all the, the tools, you see all the, the material and the, and the materiality of the material as well. And so you have all this that is very clear and, um, and put in context. So you are always uh, trying to, uh, you, you, you have access to all the, the back office, let's say, uh, in, uh, in this film, in Sector 9B. And that's, that's for, for me, was really important. And that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, to, yeah, give the viewer access to that. Thank you. And um, we, we've received uh, quite a few questions already. So um, I'll, I'll start uh, with one that is addressed to Isabelle. Uh, it's in French, uh, so I'll cross-translate. When we look at your work, uh, your installations, we immediately have this sentence in mind. Uh, the landscape is a mental construction. Uh, does that make sense for you? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, precisely how I work also into inside the system of translation from a flat image to a three-dimensional installation. And uh, there is indeed this, this idea, again, that perspective is a symbolic form. And, um, and that uh, objects are arrange, arranged uh, both uh, in a formal way, but also in a symbolic way, um, so that it brings uh, symbols and fantasies. And the, but the, mainly the system of translation, the process of working, make it quite, uh, let's say, mental and distance. It first comes from a sort of schematic drawing out of a flat images, which is a landscape from the 16th century. Thanks. Um, there, is also, there is a question to Tiffany, um, which is very broad, apologies, Tiffany. Um, can you talk a bit more about the domination? Um, should I understand that to mean about um, Scotland's colonial past? I imagine so. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that um, in terms of um, Scotland's colonial past, it really begins before the union with England. Um, so Scotland um, uh, gathered together via a subscription scheme, a fifth of the nation's wealth, roughly, um, to try and create a... Um, a a colonial territory in present-day Panama. Um, it was a massive failure and um, then Scotland's national finances were um, terrible. <laughs> um, this subscription scheme is the kind of, um, it led to the foundation of the Royal Bank of Scotland. It's called the Darien Scheme. Um, and partially because of this poor financial state that Scotland was in, um, but also because there was still the desire to have access to this um, market. Uh, this is when Scotland uh, joins forces uh, with England in the Union in, in 1707 and then so I guess um, England had already been um, quite heavily involved in setting up um, you know the East India Trading Company for example so Scotland kind of enters I guess as a kind of secondary player if you want to think about it like this and so um, but yeah uh, 
tobacco and sugar are the most uh, kind of well-known um, colonial um, products that Scotland was tra trading in, but there's also, um, as is relevant to the artist book project Delaney, a lot of uh, fabric. So the east coast of Scotland uh, produced a lot of linen, which was traded to the New World as a uh, slave cloth, um, as Osnaburgs. Um, uh, I think for complex reasons, <laughs> um, in a kind of UK context, Scotland historically liked to remember the role that it played in the abolition of uh, the slave trade, rather than its um, very active role in the kind of, uh, uh, you know, market economics. Um, and I think there's been some really interesting research coming out of UCL in London that um, they were looking at the compensation records um, for those who were slave owners, because of course that at the point where slavery is abolished, the slaves are not um, compensated, but those who own slaves and had therefore um, were considered to have lost property were compensated. And actually, Scotland is kind of disproportionately represented in those records, but not in the way that you might imagine someone to own slaves to own, you know, like a vast plantation and numerous slaves. It was often, you know, perhaps like a widow who owned two slaves that she leased out. So I think people have found the records. Um, there's also a lot of rural locations in Scotland. It's not just something that's relegated to kind of, you know, the big urban cities. It's actually, uh, it's very, very widespread. Um, yeah, um, I mean, that, that in short is some of the, <laughs> some of Scotland's colonial past. But um, yeah, as I mentioned that we, we had the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014 and, and a big part of the cultural program around that was um, starting to get to grips with some of these very difficult um, difficult questions to try to look them in the eye, I guess, for the first time. Thanks. I, I don't think you can sum up the whole history of domination in two, <laughs> two minutes, but that's a, a pretty uh, outstanding explanation and response. Uh, I'm just going to um, share two other questions um, that will probably bring us to the end. Um, to Mathieu and Isabel, <clears throat> there is a kind of tension between affect and distancy in, in both your work. Uh, how does that work and can you talk about it? And um, and maybe to, to all three of you, uh, what are your next projects? That's a nice one to, to end with. You want, you want to go for it? No, just go. Um, uh, that's... Uh, to me, affect and distancy, that's the, yeah, that's the main work, actually. And uh, that's precisely uh, finding, you know, the, um, the work is about distances, actually, and to about measuring distances, about negotiating distances, uh, ne uh, distances with, with personal history, distances with truth, truth and or fiction, uh, or the way you kind of rebuild, you use fiction to go to something which can be the truth. So that's mainly the the, the process to to negotiate. Yeah, this these distances actually. So yeah, that's. <laughs> always uh, always to reconsider yeah for me too it's the same it's the main question like dealing between um, uh, something very very specific and something generic somehow in the way that you you enter a sort of process of uh, denaturalization uh, of uh, images objects histories and is that indeed um, propose um, a questioning around facts and how things are built and and, um, and also it's about uh, generating forms so by generating forms in art you also go in the process of distancing of course Maybe, um, Tiffany, do you want to start with the last question, which is what, what is coming up for you? We, we did chat about Delinier. Ah, we, we don't hear you. 
sorry. Um, the Artist Book Project is um, going to kind of have a, a second life uh, with the V&A Museum in Dundee in September. Um, one of the one of the artists um, involved is going to have a commission with the V&A Dundee, um, but they'll also be stocking the the book, and we're going to be curating a series of events uh, with them around uh, the thematic. Um, other than that, um, I'm working on a solo presentation from Susan Prisan Locke, um, who's a London-based artist, who is director of UEL's Depot Resident Arts Institute for Glasgow International, uh, which is postponed um, from last year into this June. Um, and I have another project with Glasgow Museums uh, coming up in, in August, so it's, it's a busy year. <laughs> We lost everybody. Mathieu, do you wanna <laughs> do you wanna go next about your current project? Uh, yeah, I'm working on a on a film project actually, uh, and I must say that it's becoming more and more difficult to plan everything because it's difficult to yeah to travel. But uh, yeah, the film is a uh, is a. Uh, I think we lost Mathieu. Um, Isabel, do you want to take over until he comes back? Um, I'm working on new installation for uh, different exhibitions. Uh, one at the Musée de l'Orangerie that will start on 1st of June, which is a contrepoint with an installation and castings. And uh, also a film exhibition at uh, the Fondation uh, Ricard in, the, in June too, uh, in Paris, uh, so that it will be um, a new set of films that will be produced for the, to the for this occasion. And uh, I'm 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 definitely not Mathieu, <laughs> but just sharing some points about uh, the current film uh, that he's working on until he he joins us again, if he does. Um, to say that there he's in collaboration uh, with a sound artist um, that he's been working with for quite a while, and they're recording um, in the Guyanese forest trying to um, make the part of it more perceptible. Oh, Mathieu is back. So maybe you can uh, Yeah, well, <laughs> so what I was uh, saying that I'm, uh, so I'm working uh, on this, uh, this film, which is a portrait of uh, the Guyanese writer Wilson Harris in collaboration with the IFA Gallery in Berlin and the uh, Kessner Gesellschaft in Hanover. So that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty much basically working on that so, and uh, trying finding ways to travel. Well, um, it's already 8 p.m. <laughs> um, so I'll just end by thanking all three of you for sharing. Thank you very practices. much. Thank thanks you. a lot. Um, and thanks to the public also for your attention to these works, to obviously the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni and the team. For, for making this uh, possible despite tech issues that we had. Um, and this evening also initiates a new series of conversation um, called Art Matters. So we will stay tuned for, for the upcoming ones. Um, and a couple of partners really helped make this possible. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank directly uh, Colette Barbier from the Pernod Ricard Foundation uh, for supporting incredible artists. Uh, one of them is here today, um, and the uh, ADAGP, uh, responsible for collecting um, the visual artists' rights, French visual artists' rights, and its director, Marianne Ferrifol, um, as well as obviously Fluxus Arts Projects um, and Catherine Petitga, um, an amazing chairwoman, um, and obviously all the, all the private and, and public uh, patrons that supported the events, uh, the, the Ministry of Culture, the French Institute, the British Council. Um, I know that a lot of you have uh, shared all this on social media, so thanks to, to all those as well. Uh, the conversation will remain available on uh, Facebook and YouTube, so if you, you missed parts of it, uh, feel free to access it again. Um, and on that note, uh, just wishing everybody a really nice evening. Um, please stay safe. And uh, to all three of you, I hope we can uh, get coffee soon together. <laughs> yeah.
Thanks a lot. Bye.